get punished immediately for it. Most people have to wait, for instance, but uh, really bad actions and really super good actions can get rewarded immediately. Um, and so the super good actions are usually ones that are performed by Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, of course, and the really bad ones are performed by people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or are there any quest questions from students? No? Well, they will laugh just so you get the last question. I have actually one more question, and maybe two. Um, the various sites you showed us, and I was very intrigued about the sites at uh, CompTIA. Is it, this is a meditation cave? Yes. Uh, uh -huh. um, it uh, actually it sort of uh, you know uh, triggers in my mind as to what do we look at that? I mean, that obviously is a seclusion site. Yeah. Was, can we assume that safely? And, uh, do you find other kind of meditation caves that, where uh, clerics uh, probably do not that does not interact with uh, laymen or many yeah. community? And so uh, I wonder if um, the wheel functions um, are actually targeted for a particular type of audience. Um, in that setting, what was its possible function? I guess, it's, of course, fundamentally, uh, clerics and, and, and laymen are all the same or equal um, in terms of Buddhist teaching or Bu Buddha's teaching. So uh, maybe perhaps you could elaborate on that a little bit in this too. Maybe tell us more about uh, what do you think is the function there specifically, and then the other thing is as you showed these different sites, and I wonder, um, is there an attempt on your part to actually map out the a particular epic center of this type of painting, and then maybe perhaps a historical trajectory of its, uh, let's say, um, uh, transmission mm -hmm. from a place to another place, or vice versa? It seems like it jumps around um, quite a bit. A little bit. Uh, this is near Xinjiang or the southern southern Xinjiang. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure yes. where the, this site is. And then North, it goes on to northern Silk Road. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so two two questions. But let me start with the last one first, and I'll keep the, the this this up on the uh, on the screen for the moment. Um, uh, I think that there were, in in actual fact, in the medieval period, and I I use the medieval period very broadly, um, something like the fourth or fifth century, or perhaps as early as the end of the Han, through uh, the beginning of the Mongol period. Uh, in, in, in China, at any rate, and um, uh, there were there were a lot of paintings of the Wheel of Rebirth all throughout Asia, uh, and so few survive, and records for them are so few that uh, I just I would be foolish to chart to to take seven examples and base a theory of transmission based on them. Um, I'm, because I'm a fairly skeptical historian, and I think that I, you have to be really critical of your sources. So, um, and I think that there was just a tremendous amount of communication going on. Um, so it would be nice, and, and those barrels, I love showing those barrels because they, they're they're obvious and they're traceable, uh, and it's a great idea. Um, and um, and on the other hand, you know, if we only have seven examples for such a vast area, mm. it's hard to really chart transmission. If it were more details, like the the whiskers on the face of a ghost, mm -hmm. um, those you could trace because the same art historical materials allow you to do so, and you can talk about schools of influence and art historians from a thousand years ago wrote about this. You know how the how a dragon was portrayed by artists in the past. That's possible to do better. Um, so I, I I don't want to. Um, th but I but I do go back to the Vinaya, mm -hmm. um, which which was transmitted, and does have a clear path of transmission. And so uh, the text. Yet yeah, the, the 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 text. But you know uh, painters didn't follow texts. Painters followed what other painters did. Uh, <laughs> So um, I can track, you know, we can, we can track them, but we can't say one caused the other. Um, so I'm, I'm reluctant to because of the amount of evidence to tr track a specific process of transmission. Um, the, the function at this particular site uh, is really interesting. Um, I, this is um, 
either a cave intended for meditation or intended as a memorial mm -hmm. to a specific monk. Um, and we have a, the reason I make these claims is based on a, a, a donor inscription, about half of which survives mm -hmm. in, in Chinese. Um, this was a Uyghur influenced area, Kung Tra, it's, it's the old kingdom of Kucha. Yeah. Um, uh, and so Uyghurs rolled through here, Tibetans ruled Kucha during the period of the Tibetan Empire in, in, in uh, Central Asian Silk Road. Um, Chinese ruled it on and off. Um, uh, so it's a little hard to figure out um, all the cultural influences. Um, this is Cave 75. Um, there are about 100 other caves. Some of them are small like this. Some of them are the Hara style cave, square. They're in the shape of a square temple, residence style. Not that monks live there, but they, they have that shape. Uh, others are um, uh, follow different uh, styles of cave temples for other Buddhist uh, uh, temple styles. Central pillar style, for instance, that you find in other, other areas near here like uh, Kizil, Kudzar. Uh, um, so there are a variety of different cave types. Number one, just in terms of design, just architecturally speaking. There's a variety of uh, uh, iconographic programs, the way they're decorated. And in my rough understanding, you know, the, at least in the eyes of the designer, at least in the ideas of the painter, there was a logic to the layout uh, and to what, what paintings were put where for what reasons. Um, so uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not certain if this was a meditation cave. I'm certain it's a small cave. Mm -hmm. I'm certain not many people fit in there. Mm -hmm. I'm certain it's connected to a monk based, uh, a specific monk based on the, the, the inscriptions. Um, and I'm certain that this is the main wall because you, if, you're, if you enter the cave, this is what you see. So I'm certain that there was something about meditation going on here and the inscription goes through a, a description of some kind of meditation. Um, so something, there's something going on in this cave about meditation. But what I neglected to talk about in my lecture, you noticed, I hope, was that I didn't explain what else is on this wall. I can't figure it out. I avoided it because I don't know. <laughs> um, it looks like uh, these wheels are situated between rows of seated monks and perhaps some lay people. Now, what they were doing with the wheel of rebirth shown between them, I don't really know. Um, there's some donor portraits in this temple, in this, in this uh, cave. They're really hard to figure out. Um, so there are a variety of functions that this site as a whole served. Um, was this a private cave um, intended as a memorial for a family member? Was it intended as a memorial to a monk who specialized in meditation or taught meditation? Don't know. And that's that's my those are my best guesses. But I but I certainly admit that, uh, especially for this particular cave, the, the evidence is evidence is slim. Go ahead. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm very interested in the beast-like figure which holds the wheel. Uh -huh. um, I'm wondering, does the wheel turn automatically or the figure <laughs> controls it? And another more question is, um, you mentioned it, that um, that figure is Lama King. Mm. And then we know that Peter Varga is not a very prominent bodhisattva in India. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, in Vinaya, how it was mentioned, like about this figure? Uh, I don't know whether the wheel is spinning. I don't. I've never seen any textual reference to the action of spinning on the part of an agent. Um, and if you, I mean, philosophically, if you think about it. Uh, there should not be a a, a person a, per, a person or deity who's spinning the wheel like wheel of fortune, uh, or or like a like a roulette wheel. Uh, 